welcome to ESB Science Blast TV, delivered by the RDS. I'm Clara. And I'm John, and we are very excited because we've taken everything that's great about ESB Science Blast and stuffed it all into this amazing jam-packed TV show. That's right. As you know, ESP Science Blast is all about asking questions about the world around us. And the thing is, the answer to those questions is usually science. And that's because science is everywhere. In this episode, we'll be learning loads about cool science. We'll also be speaking to someone who actually works for NASA. That's right, Fanula O'Reilly is a data knot with NASA. And she'll be telling us all about space. I can't wait. Plus, we'll be carrying out some amazing experiments with our science expert, Mark. And not only does he have some experiments you can do too, but he will have a really impressive, super-sized experiment outside the RDS, which is bigger, more dangerous, and certainly not to be tried at home. Yep, we'll be closing the show with a bang, apparently. So make sure you stay tuned for that. But first, here at ESB Science Blast, investigating questions is what we live for. So we decided we would do just that. And something I've always been fascinated by are robots. There are robots that can do nearly everything from surgery to somersaults and from vacuuming the floor to building a car. Robots can do just about anything, it seems. But have you ever wondered if robots are smarter than humans? Ooh, that's a good one. Well, I've carried out my very own investigation to find out the answer, but I want to know what you guys think. Are robots smarter than humans? Did you know that the human brain is the most complex object in the known universe? Our brains help us to walk, talk, do maths and even ride a bike and it's our powerful brains that set us apart from every other living creature in the world. But what about the non-living creatures in this world? These days, robots can do more and more things that humans can do. So, the question is, are robots smarter than humans? So Peter, what exactly is it that you do? I build robots, all kinds of robots, from remote control robots to semi-autonomous to autonomous robots. Like, for example, I've made a Rubik's Cube solving robot that is the world's fastest robot at solving Rubik's Cubes. It's in the Guinness Book of Records. And what exactly is a robot? Well, a robot is a machine that has some kind of intelligence that can sense the world and interact with the world and makes decisions by itself. But it's a machine that we make to help us to do something that we either can't do or don't want to do. There's lots of examples of robots all around us that we don't realize are robots, like washing machines, automatic checkouts, automatic telling machines. How is a washing machine a robot? Well, a washing machine can sense when it's full of water, it can sense the temperature of the water, and it interacts with the physical world by actually tumbling and, and washing the clothes. This is a little training robot. And what he's doing, he's trying to solve this maze here. He's got these sensors here. These are sonar sensors, ultrasonic sensors. They send a sound out that bounces off a wall and comes back, and it uses that to figure out how far away a wall is. And what he's doing right now is creating a map inside its brain so that it will then be able to know how to solve the maze by itself. So it's learning as it goes. Yeah. It has the same types of components as any other robot, doesn't matter how complex it is. It's just that they might have better sensors, more sensors, or a bigger brain. And what makes robots smart? That's a great question because there's many ways that robots can become smart. One is that we tell it all of our knowledge and what we want it to do on a particular topic. Or else we can just give it some ideas of what we want it to do and let it learn by itself. And they're the smart ones, that's artificial intelligence. So here we have some of my robots that I built for Robot Wars TV show. But I can't give you a go of those because they're too dangerous. But I have a scaled down version of it that's still pretty cool. So let's go and have a go of that. Yeah, let's go. So, artificial intelligence is what gives robots their brains. But 
how do you get a machine to learn? Big companies like Google, Tesla and Nissan have all brought out their own versions of self-driving cars. One of the problems here in Ireland, though, is that they're not able for our narrow country roads, our weather and our potholes. The team here at NUI Galway have kitted out this car with some amazing technology and sensors that help the car to see and understand its surroundings better. It does this by analysing road signs, objects, people and oncoming traffic. And eventually the car will be able to make its own decisions without an actual driver. So one day you could be getting a lift to school in a car with no driver and it could be thanks to this very technology. Now, I have one more example of artificial intelligence that I want to show you guys. Except this time, it's not on the ground, it's in the sky. Do you see that tiny thing up there in the distance? Well, that's my lunch, and it's being delivered to me by drone. The drone collects packages from shops or restaurants, and then it flies at over 80 kilometers an hour to its destination. Then it's lowered down to the customer on a string. But the best thing about this is, it's not even controlled by a person. It's all done through computers and artificial intelligence. Drones like this could cut down the need for delivery drivers. They're better for the environment, and best of all, they're much faster at delivering packages. So, we've seen that robots can do more and more jobs that humans can do, and AI is being used in all sorts of ways in the world around us. But does that mean that robots are smarter than humans? Well, it's not really a yes or no answer. Yes, some robots can do things better than humans can, but those same robots can't do everything a human can do. So really, robots are just as smart as we allow them to be, for now. <laughs> I have to say, that was so much fun finding out if robots are smarter than humans. I learned loads, but I still have more questions to ask, like, Will humans ever need to work if robots do all of their jobs? Or could we ever have robot teachers? And remember, as a class, you too can carry out your own investigation. All you need to start is a question. Well, right now we are here to do some really cool experiments with our science expert, Mark. And of course, you watching can try these too. But make sure that if you are doing them, you're with a teacher or an adult. Hi, Mark. Hey, guys. OK, Mark, what have you got in store for us today? Well, guys, I love space. And I'm super psyched you're going to be talking to a data knot. So I've been inspired to make some rockets, because after all, that's how we get to space. Rockets. Cool. OK, so before we launch rockets into the sky, first, we're going to look at our rocket fuel. Our rockets are going to be powered by a chemical reaction. So in front of you, you have a bottle and there's vinegar inside it. And this balloon has a teaspoon of baking soda inside it. Now I want you to put the balloon on top of the bottle, nice and carefully so that no baking soda falls in just yet. Okay, nice and carefully. Perfect. Oops. Okay, <laughs> how are we? Getting there. Okay, excellent. Now we are almost ready to take a look at that chemical reaction. Okay, we're going to tip the baking soda into the bottle, and I want you to observe the balloon. Are we ready? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Three, two, one, let's go. Woo! Check it Whoa. out. Whoa! Whoa! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right now, there's a chemical reaction taking place between the baking soda and the vinegar, and that's releasing a <laughs> carbon dioxide gas. That gas is spreading out, pressurizing inside the bottle, moves into the balloon, <laughs> and blows the balloon up. This <laughs> chemical reaction is what's going to power our rocket. Pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> really yeah. cool. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> now, that was pretty cool, but I think we're ready now to build a rocket. Okay. Okay. What do you think would happen if instead of the balloon this time, we trapped that gas inside the bottle? Mm, okay, maybe the bottle would expand, but... Ooh. I don't think anything's going to happen because the bottle is going to be sealed. OK, well, let's take a closer look. Now, before we start building a rocket, safety first. So, safety goggles on, everyone. OK. Excellent. Now, here we have our rocket body. And you'll notice that I've put some lollipop sticks around the edges like that. That's so our rocket can stand up and point up. 
and it's important to make sure that your rocket's nice and stable before going any further. We've also put a nice little hat on top of it just to make it look a little more rockety. And to trap the gas inside, we're gonna use this cork. Okay, it's time now to prepare our rocket fuel. Now, those of you watching who want to try this, make sure you're outside and you have some parent supervision. That's really important. And if your rocket doesn't go off straight away, just leave it. Let the adult take care of it. You just move on with the rest of your life. Okay, time to prepare the rocket fuel. And again, our fuel is going to be a chemical reaction between vinegar and baking soda. So let's prepare the baking soda first. You'll need one sheet of toilet paper just like this. You're going to get a teaspoon of baking soda, put it onto the tissue paper, and then wrap the tissue paper up just like this. That's one part of our fuel. Looking good? Okay, so once you have that, you can wrap it up into a neat little package. Like a parcel. Like that. Okay, now it's time to load the vinegar into the rocket. So we're gonna pour all of the vinegar we have into the rocket, nice and carefully, so you don't get vinegar all over your hands. Okay, all that vinegar in. I'm pouring all of it in? All of it. Okay. Okay, excellent. Okay, the vinegar is inside the rocket. Mm -hmm. We have our baking soda here, and we can get our cork in our hands now. So we're getting ready for launch. Okay. How are we feeling, guys? Pretty nervous. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> okay, cool. When we're ready, we're going to put our baking soda into our rocket. Just hold it at the top so it doesn't go in just yet. Then we'll put the cork on nice and tight, and we're gonna place the rocket on the launch pad. We're gonna walk away. Ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's do this. Okay, in three, two, one. Baking soda in, the cork on and then we're gonna place it upside down, place it on the launch pad, and we're going to walk away. Uh -huh. okay. Whoa. Right now, inside the bottles, there's a chemical reaction taking place between the vinegar and the shoulder on releasing. <laughs> Three successful rocket launches. I think we just have to work on the landing a little bit more. <laughs> but uh, I think I actually preferred your reaction to that chemical reaction. <laughs> Mark, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for showing us how that works. Now, I have been warned that you have something even bigger lined up for us for the end of the show. So while you fill everyone in on what we're doing, we're going to go and get ready to chat to Fanula. OK, awesome. Thanks, Clara. So we saw what happens when we create some chemical reactions <laughs> and a crazy chemical change. But what would happen if we supersize a physical change and we mix something hot with something really, really cold? And when I say cold, oh, I mean cold. Liquid nitrogen cold. That's minus 196 degrees Celsius. What do you think would happen if we mix them together? Would they just cancel each other out or would they interact dramatically with each other? Well, you're soon going to find out. Stay tuned because this is a big one. Now, as you know, here at ESB Science Blast, we think science is amazing and we're not the only ones. There are loads of other people all over the world who love science too. And not only that, they also have really cool jobs that involve science. Yep. And today we are so, so excited to be joined by Fanula O'Reilly, who works with NASA. How cool is that? Hi, Fanula. Hi, everyone. I'm doing well. How are you? We're good, thank you. And thank you so much for joining us. Now, Fanula, you work as a data knot with NASA. Can you explain to us what exactly a data knot does? Data science is a field of technology where we use a lot of information. So when you're talking about NASA, you're talking about space data, data that we get from satellites, and ultimately we're trying to use this information to create innovation. Now, Fanula, I love space, but it's so big. It's nearly overwhelming, isn't it? Yes, you know, the, the universe is very, very big. Um, Earth is 93 million miles away from 
from the sun and uh, Mars is 142 million miles away. That's a lot of space. It takes about six months for a rocket to get from Earth to Mars. But I do know that we're interested in going first back to the moon, which will happen actually relatively soon in the next couple of years. And then from there, establishing some sort of base so that we can do further exploration to Mars. Now, Fanula, I have a very important question for you right now. Do you think aliens exist? <laughs> I love this question. I really do. We are, you know, one planet out of hundreds of millions of planets, possibly, that are out there. When, when you think about it, I think the numbers are in our favor, that we're not the only ones out there. <laughs> so I would have to say that I do think that there are aliens out there. <laughs> well, there you go, John. You've got your answer. <laughs> OK, well, Fanula, here at ESB Science Blast, it's all about asking questions about the world around us. So what I was wondering is, what questions did you wonder about when you were younger? I was curious, actually, about the past. I was more so looking towards our history. I was a huge uh, fan of dinosaurs. And so I think that was really cool because it made me interested in the environment. But also I, I was definitely interested in math, which was probably my best subject. Just questioning the things around you, I think that's a fantastic way to just start and gauge your interests. Well, speaking of curious minds and questioning, we actually have some amazing questions sent in from some children. So first up is Joe. What three subjects did you study in school to become a data not? The three main subjects that I studied was statistics and math. And I also studied how to code. So learning how to code has been very helpful for me to be able to work with computers and to be able to uh, create different applications. And I would say that you don't have to be great at everything. There are a lot of different people that specialize in a wide variety of fields. So maybe someone's a systems engineer, maybe someone's a geologist, maybe someone's an astronomer. We all don't know everything about all of these different topics, but when we all come together and collaborate on different things, we're able to share information. So it's okay if, you're, if your best subject is math or science or even English or something else. There's always room for more creativity in the world of STEM. Okay, next up is Connor. Hi, Fanula. My question to you is, as a astronaut, do you think we will see humans landing or living on Mars in the next 50 years? Thank you. I think we can do it in 50 years, yes. Excellent, okay, next question is from Quiva. Hi, Fanula. I know that NASA was involved in a successful mission to Mars this year. How did your role as a dash not help make this happen? So one of the things that I got to do for this mission was be a science communicator. We hosted a, an event to be able to communicate the science of the mission with our community. So that's a very important part of this mission because we need more and more people like you to be able to know what's going on. We want more people, more future explorers like you, to maybe one day to go to Mars yourself. Okay, well, Fanula, look, thank you so much. It has been amazing speaking to you and finding out all about space and your role as a data knot. So thank you for joining us at ESB Science Blast. Bye. 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 Thanks for having me. Wow, well, Fanula is another great example of how asking questions and being curious about the world around you when you're younger means that you too could end up doing an amazing job like working at NASA. And even if space isn't your thing, there's a good chance that science is behind whatever it is you are interested in. Time to go outside and catch up with Mark. But before we do, what we're about to do should not be tried at home. Okay, ready? Let's go. <laughs> so, we're outside the RDS, Mark, but I gotta tell you, this looks pretty dangerous. Yeah, what on earth is going on here? Well, John, Clara, we're about to do something cool, and I mean really cool. This is liquid nitrogen. It's at minus 196 degrees Celsius. That's a bit chilly. It's more than twice as cold as a night on Mars. And we're not just wearing lab coats to stay warm, we're wearing them because liquid nitrogen is so cold, it can do something like this. <gasps> it's frozen solid. Frozen solid. So with our rockets, we used a chemical reaction 
to power them and to create a gas. Here, we're going to use a physical reaction to produce a gas by evaporating the liquid nitrogen really quickly into a nitrogen gas. Now, nitrogen makes up most of the air we breathe. It's about 78% of every breath we take. In the small bin, we have some hot water. In the large bin, we have lots of liquid nitrogen. Let's see what happens when we pour the warm water into the liquid nitrogen. I hope you know what you're doing. <laughs> Our safety equipment is on, visors down. Okay, before we do this, remember, do not try this at home. Not that you have liquid nitrogen lying around at home, but anyway. Okay, guys, what do we think's gonna happen? Uh, we're gonna turn into snowmen. I don't know, the bin is gonna freeze or it's gonna break or something like that. Okay, let's pick up our buckets. Okay, are you ready? Mm-hmm. In three, two, one. <laughs> Whoa, I was not expecting that. <laughs> All the heat from our buckets caused the liquid nitrogen to evaporate really quickly, turning into nitrogen gas, creating a huge cloud in the air. <laughs> well, what a way to end the show with a bang. Mark, thank you so much. We've had a great time today exploring whether a robot is smarter than a person and what it's like to work for NASA. But there are so many other questions to be answered. For example, what does the moon smell like? Why is the sea salty? How come we don't feel great oh, after we spin around quickly? <laughs> That's right, and don't forget, science is all around us. So, if you've been inspired by anything you've seen today and you want to investigate your own questions, you can sign up for ESB Science Blast at esbscienceblast.com. You can do classroom investigations and we'll pair you up with the scientists to give you feedback. From all of us here at the RDS, we'd like to thank our sponsors, and in particular, our title sponsor, ESB, for helping us put on the ESB Science Blast every single year. For now, though, it's bye! Bye! bye.